these guys survived the David Kahn era of Timberwolves basketball and live to tell about it. It's Flagrant Howls. Dude, I'm fired up because I am going to go watch Timberwolves preseason basketball tonight, my friend Kyle. That's right. All right. Just you got me started. Let me get into it really quick. Um, So wh- I, I find myself as just celebrating another birthday, getting older at a rapid pace, like a reverse Benjamin Button. So I, I do know that I am yelling at clouds more and being just more upset about things. This isn't the biggest deal in the world. But as you go tonight, I believe your main course will not be Anthony Edwards. It'll be more like Wendell Moore and Josh which, Minot. Which, which I actually prefer. Okay. Personally. But I understand what you're saying, which is if, let's say, you're you're coming down from Brainerd or something – or you're coming up from Iowa and you're going to watch, you got your family and you, you just want to see Anthony Edwards and Carl Anthony Towns. It's a preseason game and they're, and they've already announced they're not going to play like the top eight or nine guys in the rotation. I am a sicko and I, and I also plan to go to a bunch of Timberwolves games. Right. And so I'm, I'm fine. Cause I, I get to go watch those guys play in the regular season. I'd love to take a look at 6% body fat, Luca Garza and Josh Minot. And Wendell Moore, like I want to see these guys because we're not going to get to see them starting in a week. So, but I understand your point. If you're bringing a family and you have tickets, and now it's like Anthony Edwards is going to wave to the crowd and sit down for two and a half hours, not the best look, right? And again, as another as a mutual sicko, I have carved up my entire day around watching Josh Minot play 35 minutes. I just, you know, they had five preseason games this season. The first two were in Abu Dhabi, which has been pretty much well reported that it was like a money grab. And again, teach their own. I know these teams got to bring in money as well. Um, but the NBA paid for like everything to send them over there. So you, it's kind of like what the NFL is doing right now when you lose a game to the London situation. Yeah. I just, you know, bigger picture, I just want to put this out there in the atmosphere that Wolves fans have been very loyal throughout the years and have paid for season tickets and they don't get cheaper and have invested. And usually that ROI has not turned out very well. So you had one preseason game that you're just not playing any of your guys. Again, I'm down for it. I want to watch the young guys. I also don't want, you know, the, the good guys to get hurt against uh, Maccabee from, I believe, Israel. It's that's an not, Israel. That's an Israel. Not an NBA team. So, you know, you don't want to get your NBA guys hurt against guys that may be, you know, not NBA caliber. But just, you know, I was thinking about when I worked for the Lynx one year and they had, you know, a night where they just brought in a bunch of kids, right? Like, I don't always love when these organizations only think about the money and they had one preseason game and that preseason game, you know, that might be the only game that certain families of four can afford and they're not going to be able to watch their best guys. But end rant, I hope you have a great time. <laughs> Tell me how Josh looks. <laughs> but just something to think about is that I hope the I hope the organization continues to remember that fans that have been loyal and paid a lot of money will continue to get the ability to watch the players they want to watch. Yeah, that's okay. We can all, maybe all of us can plan, all the families and everyone, we can plan a trip to Las Vegas to watch them play in the semifinals <laughs> and finals of the in-season tournament in, what, less than two months from now. It'll be great. I've heard, I don't, on a side tangent, I don't know about you, but I've heard just Las Vegas is a nightmare right now as they do that whole F1 thing. Like, I, Oh, they basically when is have that race? Coming up, I want to say November, but they have like grandstands completely in front of the Bellagio Fountain. This is for hardos that go to Vegas a lot, but like, you walk in front of the Bellagio Fountain, there's all like the pal- the palm trees and stuff. Yeah, it's they, great. Like, cut all those trees completely down, mm-hmm. and the whole strip looks like a, I guess like a, a factory. So it's really sad. But if the Wolves do play in that Final Four in Vegas, uh, I will literally force you to go with me, and we will do a live show oh. from some club. <laughs> totally in. And you also just described what downtown Minneapolis, Hennepin Avenue, maybe First Ave is going to look like with all the bleachers for the Wolves parade after they surprise everyone like the Nuggets did. Uh, let's do some burning questions here, Kyle, okay. with we're, we're about a week away from the season starting next week. So here's the status of flagrant howls, flagrant howls. We're one year into this thing, almost a year and a half, a year and three months. Cause we started this free agency, the Rudy Gobert free agency, like the week <laughs> before that happened, we started this podcast. Good timing. So you're going to continue to join every Tuesday, Tuesdays, Tuesday has been kind of our, we we switched from Wednesdays to Tuesdays here. A lot of it's subject to change if there's a game that we want to wait a day on. But Tuesdays and the next week, you'll also be on this show on Thursdays. So two days a week with you and me just spewing nonsense. And then some bonus episodes where I'll wrangle up uh, Judd and Declan, my other Score North cohorts, to to add even more to or maybe subtract. I don't know (laughs) from uh, 
flagrant howl. So we're, we've got all sorts of stuff coming your way. We're super pumped for the season, and we appreciate you guys at one point making this one of the top 30 NBA podcasts in America, according to the Apple charts. On our way up, baby. This has been, I, I didn't know what to expect. I've said this before, but I didn't know what to expect, I think, last April 2022 when you when you DM me. But uh, I enjoy the friendship that we've had. I enjoy the people that listen to this. I think it fills a niche that, you know, we're not, we are not the Dane Moore Bay podcast. I work over there. We're, we try to do something different. So I hope that two times a week again is fun for people. It's going to be weird and wonky a little bit because Thursdays, hopefully, we'll be able to talk about Wednesday night games. The mm-hmm. Wolves, I think, like never play on Thursday. So we won't miss that angle. But uh. Yeah, I'm just excited to keep talking to you about it. I also really do like when Declan hops on and Judd hops on because I think this the market's wide open right now for a good Minnesota team, uh, as you talk about daily uh, on Purple Daily with the Vikings kind of struggling. So it's wide open right now. We need as many opinions. We need to band together because this could be, and I know I've said this probably 34 other years, but this could be a special, memorable season. Okay. Well, let's segue from that. <laughs> let's go could into be, your... Could be a special season. My first burning question for you is the over under right now on most of the sports books websites is 48 and a half over or under for the Timberwolves this year. So I would say under, but I'm coming at this as like, I think there's, I think it was like two years ago, but if you go look at the standings a couple of years back, like, Dane and I did some like bold predictions on his part the other day. And one of his was that there would be like one team or no teams that win 50 games. So I think the Wolf, I think you could win 47 games and be like the three seed because yeah. I just think the West is going to cannibalize each other. I mean, both conferences are so loaded, but um, I just think that's a high number, but I don't necessarily think taking the slight under as me being down on the team. I just, every night is going to be grueling. This isn't an upcoming draft class where you're going to see teams kind of tanking like the Rockets, for example, oh, uh, unprotect or a top four protected pick to another team. So it's like, they're going to try to win every night from now until April, the Spurs. I don't know if you've watched any of those Wemby highlights, but yeah, dude really took an nice. alley-oop from the three point <laughs> line. So I just think every single night's going to be a war and maybe 48 wins is the top seed in the West. So I'm going to go under 48 and a half, but I'm still very bullish. I'm, I'm very projecting them to be like, a top four seed, like maybe the four seed in the West, but that might only be with 46 wins. I feel like this is, this is such a weird thing because I think there's two forces here. Force number one is it feels like the national perception is not thinking about the Timberwolves, like the like Correct. national media, you know, NBA fans, they would go eight or nine teams deep in the Western conference largely before they would even like consider talking about the Timberwolves or thinking about the Timberwolves the Wolves have kind of earned that as a franchise. Mm-hmm. Like they are, they haven't earned being at the top of your mind. If you're just random Joe NBA fan or talking head, I did see, I think you might've sent this to me a couple days ago on, on Twitter. Somebody had like ranked their NBA tiers or whatever. They had like three different tiers of teams in the Western conference all the way down to like nine and 10 and like no mention of the Timberwolves. Right. <laughs> Dude, so, that was a uh, I think That was during a broadcast recently. I didn't watch yes. the game, but it was Reggie Miller's like, <laughs> Western Conference <laughs> tiers, yes, and it was like Reggie Miller tier seven, tier nine. There's like, there's like, uh, like French teams in there, like nothing on the Timberwolves. Yeah, like the Gophers football team was in tier five, and he didn't even have the Timberwolves <laughs> listed, which is just like classic. I will say I've been pretty hard on like John Hollinger from the Athletic, but he did his West projections. I think he did them like eight through fifteen, so like the bottom kind of dwellers or seven through fifteen, and then like his top six. He had hit the Wolves in the top six, and he's been notoriously pretty pessimistic about the team. Zach Lowe did his league pass rankings today, which aren't necessarily tied to win projections, but he did 11 through 30. The Wolves weren't in there, so they're a top 10 team for him as well to watch. Uh, So there might be a narrative, slight narrative change on a national perspective, but for the most part, yeah, it's like everyone sees the Thunder and like, oh, the Thunder is going to win eight more games. And as I was telling Dane the other day, the last time the Thunder played a basketball game, they were relatively healthy except for Chet Holmgren, and I think they lost by 35 points to Minnesota. Minnesota didn't have Nas Reed or Jaden McDaniel, so they won't be respected until they actually win games. They might be yeah. better off with lower expectations because you saw how they literally fought each other last year when the bar was high, but uh, I, I'm with you in the sense that I think they're going to be a really good team. I just don't know if they can hit 49 wins. Yeah, so I guess 
so the other sort of current here is so one is I and you're right there are there have been at least some like the Hollingers there's been a couple that are putting them in maybe their proper place but largely feels like people are sleeping on the Timberwolves it also kind of feels like there's 13 formidable teams in the Western Conference yep. in terms of teams that could beat you on any given night or that are better than you so how do those forces play against each other I'm gonna go over dude. I okay, think this fair. team is loaded with talent. Anthony Edwards coming off the FIBA World Cup just and the and the playoff success just feels like unlocking a whole new level of confidence and stardom. And I think he's starting to understand that night to night grind as well. Carl Anthony Towns, and we're gonna get to well, we can talk more in depth about some of these players and some of these other questions, but like he's healthy. Some of it's going to be, how does he fit? But they've had now a year to sort of figure this out. They all know who's on the roster, who's going to play together. And they've swapped out from a 42-win team that was without Carl Anthony Towns for 53 games. They swapped out a lot of really bad minutes with a lot of really good minutes, likely. Shake Milton is going to take over for, like, Jalen Noel's minutes, right? You can We can kind of piece that together. So, dude, I think, I think, and the Wolves are going to have more inspiration than some of these other Western Conference teams to just dominate the regular season. So I'm going over, man. I'm going over, heading toward 50 for the first time in 20 years. I th- I think the, well, we talked about this last year, but it was very apparent that last year's team was the deepest team in franchise history. And it by no means, like, is this team any less deep? This is even deeper. Uh, like, I was looking this up for last year for total minutes played. Jalen Noel was sixth on the team last year in total minutes played and was not good. Uh, and even though you know you and I were had bought into him yeah. during a couple hot streaks, like you're just you're just hacked. giving more of those minutes to more proven players like a Shake Milton and Nikhil Alexander Walker. So I think if last year's focus or single word term definition was depth, I think this year's might just be continuity. There's not a lot of teams that are bringing back as many guys, even if you didn't think the experiment worked or whatever. Not a lot of teams around the league. I mean, the Warriors are like trying to figure out Chris Paul into their starting lineup. Like there's a yeah. lot of teams that have lost key contributors, and the Wolves basically just, for better or worse, trimmed the fat and replaced that fat with just very healthy proteins, right? And, well, and the keel and, and shake, and even a guy like Troy Brown Jr. And to your point about Jalen Noel, sixth most minutes on... So in terms of minutes per game, just think about this. Jalen Noel played just under 20 minutes per game last year, and he played 65 games. So he, he played a huge chunk of games. Austin Rivers, good leader... Gave you some good minutes here and there, but was not like Austin Rivers at this stage in his career. It was not a guy that should be averaging 20 minutes a night for, you know, 52 games and 10 starts on a team that aspires to be a 50 win team. I'll give you another one here, too. This might be controversial. A guy who averaged over 20 minutes per night. But if you look at like some of the advanced metrics, he was not he was not like an efficient player for them. Torian Prince. So T- Torian Prince had like oddly bad advanced stats last year. His player efficiency rating was atrocious. His win shares per 48 were really bad. Some of his defensive numbers, like he just wasn't, he wasn't a quality player according to some of the metrics, even though he had some games where he flashed. Wasn't that that Knicks game? Wasn't that the one he went he off last year? He kind of single-handedly year? won it for yeah. him, yeah. But so I, it's kind of weird. Torian Prince, who by all accounts was like a really good locker room guy too, there's very few things to poke holes in his resume when he was here, but the things you can poke holes in are actually rather large holes. <laughs> so, and, you kind of, and you kind of fix some of them, it feels like. He might yeah, be getting older. You know? and, and I also think, too, like, again, we, we've talked about it ad nauseum, but upgrading from, you know, D'Angelo Russell has looked really good for the Lakers, and I, I, I do wish him well down there, but upgrading to a more or a less ball-centric point guard in Mike Conley, who's just a more mature yes. person, um, I don't really think I don't have a lot of notes to tell you about Nick's Wolves the other night because I was tailgating and watching college football, but I've rewatched the game on Sunday morning. One thing I thought from that that I wanted to bring up in the second half of Wolves versus Knicks, the Wolves had 25 made baskets or 25 assists on 25 made baskets. Every basket they made in the second half against the Knicks was assisted. And to me, you're starting to see real like concrete examples of like Finch ball where the yes. ball is just moving around. There's a couple highlights on Twitter where, like, the ball is just moving around the perimeter, and guys are like, I have a good shot here, but I'm going to make one more pass for a great shot. And that guy's like, I'm going to make one more pass for an elite shot. Nikhil gets a three in the corner. And then the so, shot clock runs out. <laughs> yeah, ah, then, so I, I, I do think the continuity, 
the ability to know these, you know, a lot of these guys one through eight, at least, you know, depending on where you put in Shake Milton, like these guys have all played together now for a while. They have a training camp under their belt. Finch is getting the ball moving. They're not so, you know, ball centric ISO. Uh, I can, I'm with you on the over 48 and a half. Like I support that. I just think I'm concerned about how good the West is and that might trim a winner too off. Doesn't sound like you, you believe (laughs) that sounds like to me. Uh, Okay. Burning question. Number two here. What is your hottest take about the 2023-24 Minnesota Timberwolves right now? <sighs> no, I can only come up with so many takes right now. So not to recycle this one, but I I think this team is very deep. I think you're bringing back 52 more games of Carl Anthony Towns. You know, all things considered, turning off injuries, this team should be really, really good. I told Dan the other day, I don't think Kyle Anderson will be on the team after the trade deadline. And Kyle Anderson is the greatest free agent signing in team history and has this massive role. Mm-hmm. And he's up. Like, I just am looking at all the things you just said about replacing bad minutes with good minutes and coming into the situation of at some point, guys are going to have less of a role this year than they had last year. Kyle at the forefront of that. And he's older. He's in a contract year. Like, does that make sense? If you know, we've always talked about, is it going to be Carl or Rudy next summer that they, they move off of? Well, you know Nas Reed is next in line for one of those spots. Where does Kyle fit into any of that, right? Like, you also want to, at some point, get Leonard Miller in the mix, Josh Minot, Luca Garza. So this team has so many big guys, and now they have a competent point guard. They want to lean more into Ant. They have Nikhil. I just don't see Kyle Anderson as great as he is and as professional as he is. I don't know what his role is, and I, I wonder if he's the piece they dangle to try to, you know, add more shooting or make an adjustment uh, in February. Do you think, and they also have, you know, they have like luxury tax issues mm-hmm. coming up mm-hmm. in, in the summer of next year. Call me crazy, but there was a time where Adrian Payne was traded for a first round pick like 10 mm-hmm. years ago, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Would a contending team looking for, let's say, let's say Kyle Anderson just, let's say the team is going well, but his but his role is limited for all the reasons you, you, know, you mentioned. Would a contending team give you a late first round pick for him at the trade deadline? Needing a glue guy that can do a million different things, you know? People and people listening to this are going to absolutely think you're crazy. But it also comes down to, like, I don't know, would the Lakers? No, because they have one more pick in the 2020s that they can even dangle. Mm -hmm. But if, like, the Thunder could cut, like, you know, maybe Josh Giddey, who's kind of a five-tool guy for them. Like, if they they were playing really well, but they needed a – I mean, Kyle Anderson next to Chet Holmgren – makes a lot of sense you'd have so, to match a salary too which makes yeah. it hard because they'd be kicking back an asset and a, a pick. but you know some some teams just have way more first round picks that like giving one mm-hmm. up is like just giving up spices whereas like some other mm-hmm. teams it's like all we have in the in the kitchen is a box of steaks and nothing else so i don't think that would be that crazy and i also think too this is why it would be something to monitor kyle anderson's a really important piece of this team i think he's a good leader he'd be a really important piece of another team do you want to go give a, co- a competitor, a good player, but I just keep coming back to, you know, we're so focused on the second apron and we're so focused on this Jaden McDaniels extension and Ant and Carl and Rudy, but Mike Conley's a free agent after this year. Kyle Anderson's a free agent after this year. And if you're not yeah. going to keep those guys, even if you're in the the hunt or you are being really competitive in January and February, you do have to keep an eye towards the future because the Rudy Gobert trade painted, we've said this for a year and a half, painted you in a situation where every move needs to be really calculated. You can't be really reactive. You need to be proactive in how you do this roster building. So I don't know. I don't, I don't, I hope Kyle Anderson is here forever and builds a house and raises his family. But I, I wonder if he's in the long-term plans for this team. Boy, look at So, so far you think they're going to underachieve the <laughs> 40 and a half and they're, they're going to get rid Kyle. of Kyle Anderson. Boy, look at you. Uh, here's my hottest take. And I have, people can clip these and throw them back in my face in five months. Carl Anthony Towns and Anthony Edwards will both make all NBA teams at the end of the season. Now, Ant has never. Carl's been a third teamer before. Mm-hmm. I think this is, let's start with Cat here, because this is a perfect situation for Carl Anthony Towns. I hope he sort of realizes it and, and feels it too, because no longer should he feel the weight and the pressure of an entire franchise that he, because he's been looked at for a long time maybe even up until like a year ago, like I would say even into the first year of Anthony Edwards as the guy that has to save and fix this franchise. And I've always felt like he hasn't had the personality to really own that. It's it's always felt uncomfortable. He's always felt like the uncomfortable figurehead superstar of a team. 
And I've clearly said my piece about that for years and years on this show and other shows. But as a guy that can sit sort of behind Anthony Edwards a little bit, I'm not even saying take a back seat in terms of like never taking a big shot in the fourth quarter. And like he might even average more shots than Anthony Edwards by the end of the year. But he can kind of take a back seat in terms of pressure. He can sit out there and launch threes. He doesn't. He's not expected to protect the rim and lead the team in rebounding. That's Rudy Gobert. He's not expected to lead the team in scoring and shoulder the load in terms of shot creation late in games. That's Anthony Edwards. He's not even really expected to be the face of the franchise anymore. That's Anthony Edwards. So like in terms of pressure and situation, he can kind of sit there and be himself and 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 go launch eight to ten threes every single night. So I think just I'm just this is a theory, obviously, that has to play out in real life, but could a more comfortable situation and a healthier year for Carl Anthony Towns lead to a breakthrough here? That's what I wonder. And I, I already said it with Anthony Edwards, like that dude with the FIBA World Cup and every all the confidence that he has gained and the experience should be a next level transformation for him. So I think both those guys, that's my hottest take. Wow. I can't believe we're to be all NBA. entering this with you being, I mean, and I'm not pessimistic by any means, but I, you are just... And I love it. I will say to those that want to poke holes in your prediction, uh, the Timberwolves actually did have two players make All NBA back in 2018. That's when Jimmy Butler and Carl Anthony Towns did it. So there's a so cool it has little, happened before. It yeah, has there are there before. are teams like oh, who's one here? Like the Memphis Grizzlies have never had that happen. The Lakers in 2020 had uh, LeBron and AD, but um, just five years ago the Wolves and that you know what what did the Wolves do that year? They were really good. Right, mm-hmm. they were top what three, four seed or whatever. So they won a lot of games. I just keep you call me back. a cat hater, everyone. Okay, you call <laughs> me a cat hater. Okay, uh, and track mark this. I don't. This might be the good time to do it, but I'm going to let you keep giving me bold predictions, and then maybe I'll drop this at the end. But when I'm trying to think of if this team is successful, what would be like the most profitable bet to place as like a future bet? So you give me another bold prediction, but I don't forget. I want to say that at the end. Although that is, I mean, that is my hottest take. But okay. I have an, I have another one that I think, God, you're reading my mind here. Because my, my third uh, pressing or burning question is, which player's stock will have clearly risen six months from now? I, know, I promised myself I wouldn't talk too much about a meaningless Knicks game. Uh, I, we came into this offseason and then this training camp with the news of the new CBA and like at some point, man, you're going to have to move off of Carl and Rudy because it's just going to be too expensive to have them. Obviously, Ant got his max deal. Jaden is looking like also we can maybe talk about the Jaden McDaniels, TJ Hawkinson comp, uh, but he might be making way more money than we thought. But we always thought Carl or Rudy because of finances. Mm-hmm. I think it might be Carl or Rudy simply because of Nas Reed. Nas Reed has looked so good in the preseason looks so good against the Knicks I think he had four threes in the first half um so to answer that question I, I Ant could take off and be you know all NBA I mean I even think as much as we loved him in Team USA if Anthony Edwards is one of the 15 best players by the end of the year that's a pretty big deal even though we kind of think he can do it actually seeing it like I remember when he made the all-star team I was like oh my god the kid actually made an all-star team that's awesome um I don't know if Carl Stock I don't know how high Carl Stock could go, even if he was really good. I guess you know, Jaden McDaniels could maybe take a leap. But I think Nas Reed, I mean, when you hear the Knicks announcers after, you know, multiple times of calling him Anthony Towns, they were blown away by, like, who's this guy that super weird looks like a fullback and is taking threes? They had no idea who Nas Reed was. And I think by game 50 or whenever the Wolves do play on national TV, the national audience will be well aware of who Nas Reed is, not just locally. Yeah. So you're going Nas. Uh, I want to say just based on opportunity and, and Conley's going to miss some games. I almost said Conley, by the way, because I feel mm. like it's like stock among Wolves fans. There are so many Wolves fans. Dude, I got clowned so hard at the trade deadline when they made that trade. And I said, even without the other pieces like this, Nikhil Alexander, like the second round picks straight up, I'd rather have Mike Conley than D'Angelo Russell on this team. And I feel like that has been proven right. Clown for that. I think his stock could go up even further. We, he did a uh, he's doing this thing with uh, oh. Jace Frederick now every like couple weeks where 
Jace is giving him a platform to kind of just like speak and write uh, Pioneer Press and Twin Cities. Conley's Corner. Definitely brilliant yeah. idea by Jace. Great name, by the way, as someone who loves alliteration. Uh, but I think that'll be really cool. And Mike Conley is a brilliant basketball person. So him talking to Jace and just dumping X's and his, X's nose on the paper will be awesome. So, but he, But he talked about how there's a lot of other players that are as old or older than he is. I mean, Chris Paul, LeBron James, mm-hmm. they're superstar players, and those guys have played at a very high level late into their 30s and take care of their body. He's younger than some of those guys, and people are already kind of saying, like, ah, you know, Conley, look how old he is. He's young. But he takes care of his body. So my honorable mention was I actually think his stock is going to rise by playing here for a full season. But um, I'm going to go uh, I'm gonna go Shake Milton, actually. I oh, think. okay. That's fair. I, you know, the only thing is he's been – I was going to say Nikhil Alexander Walker for stock rising because I think there's just like he's going to get more exposure and play more minutes than he did. So naturally, he's going to have a stock go up. I do wonder with Shake Milton, he's been averaging about 20 minutes a game, largely off the bench for the Sixers the last few years. I don't know. And you can tell me if I'm wrong on this. I don't know that you can find him more than 20 minutes a game on this team unless Mike Conley's out for a stretch. No, so that, it might be a little tough for him to like, like have his stock go way up, but. Maybe it's like his stock compared to the minutes that he's filling from last year, the Jalen Noel minutes that are going to. But I think people are going to really like what Shake Milton brings to the table. And people around the organization and the team in these first couple of weeks of training camp rave about him and that he is just he's efficient, dude. Yep. And, and all the basketball stuff they rave about, but also to just his demeanor. He's very no nonsense professional. I think he's the exact I mean, he's he's an older player in the sense of he's not 20, but I think he's only like 26, 27. So he uh, he's just another dose of maturity. And I think, you know, when you think back to what Anthony Edwards has, who he's played alongside growing up, right? Like Ricky Rubio, D'Angelo Russell, even to a positive, Pat Bev, now Mike Conley. Like, he's just been surrounded by a lot of mature, smart guards. Mm-hmm. And that's elevated his kind of, or sped up his, his maturity. So I'm with you on that. I thought you were going to say Nikhil. Uh, I I think he'd be my honorable mention uh, because I just I we only have a limited sample size right of these preseason games and every time they can't start one of their favorite young guys whether that be Jaden or whether that be Ant Finch just plugs Nikhil in and I wonder if Nikhil behind the scenes is one of Finch's like three favorite players he had him in New Orleans he loves his ability to just plug multiple holes Uh, I, I think it could be a really really big year for Nikhil now that he found a home got paid and has that stability that a lot of players really want. Yeah. And my last burning question for you is, because, you know, ultimately it is a doom and gloom franchise. It's the Wiley Coyote of cartoons. It's just, it's, it's Charlie Brown, you know, Lucy pulling the football. That's what the <laughs> Wolves have been. Whenever you get optimistic, something bad happens. So what is the creeping death thing that you are the most nervous about happening? Or what's, what's the thing that you're just like on alert for with this team? Uh, well, I mean, injuries aside, yeah, be, let's put because, injuries aside because I do, you know, there, I just think a, a drastic blow to one of the kind of core four w- would be pretty brutal. I keep coming back to just this idea of, and it's kind of two parts. Like we, I don't think there's a, I don't think there are all the 29 NBA teams, I think have flexible starting lineups. Whereas like, oh, you know, throughout the season, if this doesn't work, we're going to, we're going to slip this guy in and slip out. I really wonder if the Wolves are the least flexible starting five in the league. Like, it is. you can't at any point not start Ant, Jaden, Carl, or Rudy. You just can't, like, just because you'll get raked over the coals on Even every Conley, national platform. It's like, you have to start Conley because... And, like, and I, Mike would be the one, but it's like, I don't know how Mike doesn't start because Finch loves his ability to kind of be his coach on the, on the, on the court. So yeah. I am concerned about if, you know, even against the Knicks the other night, they came out kind of stale I thought and then once they started to switch up rotations and add some guys in and play different lineups that's when it started to really hum what happens if 30 games in like your worst five-man pairing is your starters like are you able to do that and then that also just ties into uh I thought there was some really cool comments after practice the other day from Ant and his relationship with Finch uh he basically said he's like that's my dog and if you know what that means yeah I f with Finch which would be a great shirt uh so if if it doesn't necessarily get out of the tracks early and they stumble, is Finch going to be kind of the most common or the easiest scapegoat? Uh, and I don't think Finch had a perfect season last year. I think there are holes to poke in his coaching as well. But 
I always circle back to behind the scenes, the stuff that we don't always get to see. The players love him, and he controls that locker room, and I hope that they give him a long enough leash that, you know, if it stumbles early, they he's empowered to make decisions that are really tough decisions, like, hey, maybe, Rudy, you're not going to start or whatever, but that's my one big concern is uh, if this doesn't get as hot as we think it is in October, November, how do does everyone respond from top to bottom? Yeah, that's a really, that's a good one, and it obviously it was on display at the beginning of last year, but you almost have to give them a pass for the, like the first two or three months of last year as they tried to figure out how do we right. make this work? Mm-hmm. You know, hell we saw, we use this as an example, 20 years ago, the best Timberwolves team in history, a 58 win team that went to the Western conference finals, the 2003, 2004 team, Kevin Garnett, Sam Cassell, Latrell Sprewell. They were like 500 into December yep. because they were, they were trying to figure out how to play together and, and who was supposed to do what. So it takes time. But you are right in that if it is determined after however much sample size, hey, Gobert and Cat can't really play together that much, but you have to play it. Like you literally have to play them together for a certain amount of minutes minimum in order to make this thing work. Right. So Mm -hmm. the other thing I I would say along those lines is can you find 20 to 25 minutes for Nas Reed when one of those other bigs isn't hurt? Like what does that look like? You're, You're almost like, boxed into certain things you're boxed into cat and go bear you're boxed into you really would like based on the contract and how good he can play Nas Reed to get a certain amount of minutes but you can't play him in certain lineup combinations so like that whole puzzle does feel a little rigid to me to your points my biggest thing in terms of things I'm nervous about is more big picture organizationally we've now seen three different reports our guy Doogie who has a lot of intel I saw Charlie Walters, who's super plugged yep. into all things Wolves. Have, like, There's been some speculation that Mark Laurie and Alex Rodriguez have been really lax on communication with Glenn about the sale process, and there are some questions about whether the sale is going to get finalized when it's supposed to here in a few months. So just organizationally, what does all of that look like? I don't want Glenn Taylor to be the majority owner of this team anymore. It feels like we've just been organically moving out of that era of Timberwolves darkness and into the new, fun, fresh, Mark Laurie-led organization. And I just don't, like, if that somehow falls through and then Glenn Taylor just owns the team again for the foreseeable future, I don't know that I can handle that. So big picture, that's one thing I have my eye on. I, I will say I am... I co-sign everything you said. Uh, I would hope that people listening to this know that after doing this so long, like I'm never, ever going to try to report things, but you hear enough, right? People just talk to you and tell you things. So I have heard some of that as well. I'm optimistic that if it's not the December deadline for this final payment, that they, they do find it at some point Yeah. over the next, you know, eight months or whatever. I think they might have until March or something, but bigger than that or more than that, it's just, you know, this goes back to my Ricky Bobby thing. It's like, we're all at Applebee's now and everything seems so good. And who is going to be the person that's just like, I'm actually uncomfortable when things are so good. I got to mess this up. And yeah. if that's Glenn Taylor, get out. And if that's Mark and Alex, get out. Like, don't mess this up because this goes back to my rant two minutes into the show. Like, this fan base now is really excited because there is a level of talent, stability, structure, optimism that I don't really think existed for many years. Uh, stay out of the way, right? And that's kind of why... I go back to the Finch thing. Tim Connolly, despite the Rudy Gobert trade, has made pretty much flawless moves since then. Stay out of his way. Stay out of Finch's way. Like, let these guys do what they do. You guys figure out, you know, bookkeeping and all that stuff on the other end. But um, it is a concern. I'm optimistic, but it's a concern that I think about more and more until, you know, Mark and Alex have the keys to the building. Yeah. So, all right, those are the burning questions here. Maybe we can come up with some more burning questions for next week because I think we still get one more preview episode before the actual season starts. Can we, uh, I know we got jobs to do and places to go, but can we end this quick with just a shout out uh, to our friend, yes. um, our brother, Jim Peterson. Uh, it was reported earlier this week that he uh, has been going through prostate cancer and was receiving treatment down in Mayo. Um, I've been very open on this show and other shows about what cancer has affected my life and my family. I work in cancer research on a daily basis. I know cancer has taken a toll on your family as well. So Both parents, both parents. Um, we just want to give- Gone. All our love uh, to Jim, um, also to like Marnie Gellner. It is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Um, and again, as someone who works in this industry full time and just talks on the pod part time, like 
please, please, if you're listening to this or you have friends or family or anyone, loved ones, have them get regular checks, have them go to the doctor. I hate the doctor. I hate the dentist, but it's really important to take care of yourself. Uh, we love Marnie. We love Jim. And uh, yeah, just make sure you focus on your own health. Uh, the Timberwolves I know, aren't always at the forefront of health, but um, real things like cancer and it's just, it's a bear on, on the patient and, and the families and their loved ones. So continue to get regular checks, continue to go out there um, and talk to your friends about it. It's not faux pas to talk about your health anymore. Uh, and it's really important yeah. to me and to Phil. So love you, and Jim. One thing about Jim too, and I love Jim as well. Um, Jim, you know, sometimes you, you watch people on TV or you hear them on the radio or whatever, and then you find out that they're actually not what you think they are. Maybe they're putting on an act or whatever it is. You can tell you, Jim Pete comes off as the nicest, most likable, can sit down and drink a beer with him guy when you watch him on TV. That is exactly who he is behind the scenes. Yep. He is just an all-time great, beautiful human being. And so, yep, I echo what you just said. I'm glad you brought that up at the end of the show. We're rooting him on, and hopefully hopefully he can keep pushing forward with his treatment. We're going to get him on the show at some point again, talk some Timberwolves, and hopefully he's back on uh, the yeah, he'll be there for the Yeah, he'll be there for the Raptors game, I believe. I was texting him yesterday. So Boom. Uh, he's, he's, I think he's got the cancer out of his body, but, you know, a scary time for him and his family. So just take care of yourself, anyone listening to this. Um, there are a lot of resources out there. Hit me up uh, on the YouTube comments or Twitter or whatever. Like, I have a lot of resources if you're wondering for patient advocacy or any of those things, places to start. Uh, but a scare in our little community, right? We talk about this being a lifestyle podcast and part of a lifestyle is your health and scary things like this. So Jim will be back. Marnie is back. Um, but scary moments for them for sure. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Kyle, for, uh, for bringing that up at the end of this episode. And like Kyle said, this is a Timberwolves lifestyle podcast, Flagrant House. If you could give us a five-star rating and a positive review on Apple podcast, you can help us maybe even climb those Apple national (laughs) basketball podcast charts again. And click the like button and the subscribe button on the Score North YouTube channel. We will see you next time on Flagrant Howls.